Greetings, everyone, and welcome to R. Kelly Appeal TV, where we discuss the topics that relate to the appeal process of Robert Sylvester Kelly. You are now listening to the We Can Fly in July series, where we share with you the highs and lows of waiting on the appeal and the Chicago trial together. I choose to bring this live on a bit earlier than expected uh, due to my busy schedule. So the backstory for the R. Kelly Appeal TV begins March 23rd, 2011. The backstory is the story behind the story. So a lot of people wonder why I'm so passionate about the R. Kelly Appeal TV and why that is so important to me. And I must literally tell you that Again, I did not know that I was going this route, so I have to put this out there. Um, it was about seeing an individual being wrongfully accused in the criminal justice system. And many of you that have followed me, you know that I'm a criminal justice major and that's where my passion really comes from. And so in this passion, I want to share the backstory behind the R. Kelly Appeal TV. So March 23rd, 2011, remember that date because that is going to be an important date when I talk about the backstory to the um, connection that I have. Um, so remember that date. Also because it's my death date of addiction and my recovery date of healing. For those who understand where I'm coming from, um, I hope you do. Because it's when I sought recovery diligently, I started to, to save my own life. And that's what we have to do when we are in positions like Robert Sylvester Kelly, where we don't know which way to go. We've done things that make us look accusing. You know, we've done said things or saying things that just don't jive up. And, and so it causes people to judge us unfairly. You know, the, the love of money is the root of all evil. And in that, I noticed, even in my own recovery, that when it's time to grow, we got to leave all that stuff behind. And I believe that's what's happening in the case of Robert Sylvester Kelly today. He is growing into his maturity. And in that growth, what's happening is he's leaving the R. Kelly he once knew behind him. That's the difference when people say, well, he wasn't 55 years old when he did these things, when he did these acts. And of course, we would expect more accountability at 50 than we do at 19 and 20. And that's why we have to make sure that we empower our young men to know the difference between lust and love, you know? So that's when I started to really seek my recovery diligently. Without my journey, I don't believe that I would understand what R. Kelly is going through, nor even care to be as passionate about what happens in these trials for him. You know, you think about it. When we are in our healing, we have motivated ourselves to help another. We have made sure that we are not being so selfish. Selfishness is a horrific thing. So <laughs> as I'm going through my processes, I'm not really busy with watching R. Kelly's life. In 2011, I was trying to save my own, you know, so... At this particular time, I was facing like 34 years of my life to a criminal justice system in ways that I couldn't even imagine I was there. It felt like a dream. It felt like it was unreal. 
I was in many ways like Robert Sylvester Kelly in the sense that I took life by the horns at this time while I was waiting on bond, on bond five years, confused, trying to wake up, you know, and around that time, 2011, there were a, a lot of communication about removing the concepts of what we once knew and trying to make sense of it all because things had changed. So there was this consciousness that was surrounding the world around 2011. And I was real confused. I'm like, wow, you know what I mean? I woke up to so much that I had to clean up and fix up and make up, you know? Um, so I took life by the horns and rode the chaotic waves and excelled to my highest potential during this time. Graduated from college, yes. Got a divorce, yes. Started a business, yes. Got custody of grandchildren, yes. Um, started a self-help um, uh, publishing company, yes. While awaiting bond. I was doing everything I needed to do, but yet I was also helping myself because I was entering into this world known as um, the rooms of recovery, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, um, and all the other anonymouses. It's so many, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I started to heal and help myself while waiting on my fate because I'm like, okay, if I'm going to take it to trial, get 34 years that's a lot. I'm done. That's life. You know, at the age I was, I think I was like 35, 36. I can't even remember when the journey started, but I know it was in 2011, March 23rd. So while waiting bond, knowing the worst case scenario could possibly come, I realized at that point that freedom is never free. It's a costly, expensive piece of equipment that we carry on the planet and i began to realize my greatest strength as whitney houston would say so by 2013 i'm still awaiting bond halfway into it not even knowing it futuristically i didn't know it until it was past done so i was even unsure of what had even happened to me but during this time my higher power tested me and gave me a mentor. And this mentor helped me to reveal the strength that I had to even help someone else. So this counseling was so severe. It was so important. And then lo and behold, I found that I became a mentor to a young man who was in and out of prison. <clears throat> Uh, I never met this person before. Um, they found me on a website and they consulted with my company and I started to life coach him. And I was thinking to myself, am I even qualified to do this? Yes, I had an LLC. Yes, I had a degree. Yes, I had the international um, ability to do um, um, coaching and leadership and, and all that. Yes, I had the business license, but was I equipped going through what I was going through? Was I equipped enough to say, I'm ready for this? I'm ready. So I had done a lot of physical work on myself. I got into nature. I began to meditate. I began to check in my own self into rehabilitation because I thought at this point something had snapped in my mind and I was crazy, but it wasn't that. It was a lacing. It was, um, um, that's what the streets call it. It was an inducement of what I would normally not take. However, it, I ingested something foreign into my body that totally made me the incredible hawk. That's what you know, the court um, paper states in my situation. And and um, I began to go through counseling and rehab and I began to heal myself through my own recovery from this 
thing that I didn't even realize was going on. This emotional trauma, the alcohol addiction, being in the closet, trapped in the closet with alcohol addictions and coming coming out, putting on the stilettos, putting on the business suit, wearing the fake hair, putting on the fake contacts, wearing the fake nails, getting the pedicures, the manicures, the trips and all that good stuff. And life stress was still happening for me. My drug of choice was anger. <laughs> mm. My drug of choice was anger because I had lost my mother. I had lost my stepfather. I had lost my grandmother, grandmother, the pillar to my life had all been wiped away when this awakening took place. So yeah, I was angry. I was angry at the world. And so I had to learn to heal a different way. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm still learning to this very day how to heal. So I understand what Robert Sylvester Kelly is going through right now. He's feeling the the aggression. He's feeling the um, the trauma behind the awakening. He was awakening and so now he feels it. So, so I want to take you down memory lane with me on a journey when I had really decided to walk out into life again after being traumatized at my weakest moment and taken advantage of. So trust and know, I know what it feels like to be traumatized, victimized, and taken advantage of. However, I never believed that, you know, I had a right to charge someone else for the victimization that I created within myself. How many know what I'm talking about today? You know, traumatization is the terminology by who we consider our closest intimate people, our best friends, our husbands, our wives, our children that turns around and manipulates destroys, impacts in a negative way where our lives should be headed. There was no way. Yes, I had almost a half a million dollar insurance policy from all the deaths that took place and people seeing things, but they didn't know where I, what I was doing in the middle of the night, the tears that I was crying, wishing that I had my mother with me because she was the pillar of everything that I had done in my life. You know, I gave credit to her. She was my God because she taught me so much and she took the time to reveal and put me in a position where I was safe to grow up and where I was safe to experience life. And then she allowed me to make my mistakes. And she, you know, for those who understand the concept of, being a Scorpio, a Scorpio and a Sagittarius. Wow. You know, we had a lot of clash, but yet we had a lot of, of, of intimate conversations and, and strengthening and endurance. You know, she was trying to build me like I was an athletic runner or field person, you know? So, so I just want you to know that that's what's really happening here in this, this situation. So I'm going to read a letter that was sent to me that truly tested my addiction. Okay. It's going to seem as though I'm talking to the gentleman that I'm responding to in a letter. But in the end, you're going to hear how this letter was truly being spoken from a higher source within me to help me manifest my own journey into recovery while still being fresh in. You know, most people say when you leave prison or leave jail, you fresh out. But when you go into recovery, you're fresh in. So my healing date continues and will do so for as long as I'm on this planet. It's a healing process that's every day when you awaken to it. Some of us need to be born into it because of the addictions of our own, of our parents bringing us to the planet. So I'm just so grateful to be back in my right aligned state of mind. 
with the help of the God that I serve within me. So I'm going to read this letter to you and hopefully you'll be able to understand where I'm coming from. So on October 25th, 2013, so you can imagine March 23rd, 2011. Now we're in October 25th, 2013. I received a letter from a person who wants to be mentored. Okay, so I'm gonna read it. Dear Miss Wisdom, I will call myself Wisdom. My name is, we'll call him, let me see here. So we're gonna call this guy David, okay? And there was a lot of Davids around me at this time. Um, growing up with a David, uh, motivating myself with a lot of individuals and from the Christian per perspective. So Davids were very, very normal to me. So my name is David. After meeting with you, my family was very impressed and encouraged me to contact you. My family is my rock. They are very loving, caring, and forever forgiving. That right there is something that a manipulator can really take advantage of. You know, a caring and forever forgiving parent because they only want to see the best for their kids and they'll do everything. They'll go above and beyond do through guilt in order to help, you know, this individual. And this is coming from a person who by the time I awakened, I knew I was spoiled, rotten. But by the time I awakened, everything, everyone was gone. You know, mother, father, stepfather, and um, and grandmother, aunts, cousins. You know, a lot of people had, you know, passed on. So I knew what it was like to get that forgiving feeling. But when it's no longer there, you feel very, very, like, empty. You feel extremely empty. So let me finish reading. They are always there for support and guidance. But I consistently push them away when I, when I release, when I am released as I just want to make up for lost time. First, I look forward to meeting and working with you. Throughout my life, since I was 17 years old, I have struggled with an understanding of my addictions and finding a solution to cure them. I am 43 years old, and this was at the time of 2013 and have experienced issues with drugs, alcohol, gambling, stealing, as well as having mental disabilities. I consistently struggle with relapsing into these problems because I don't understand how to fight them. It seems whenever I get bored, I revert back to these actions. So often I feel depressed and alone and need something, an action or an addiction to cope. And see, that's one thing that I, would like to interject here. When we say boredom, that is the concept of how society tries to dumb down an individual. And when we're dumbed down, we don't have anything to fill the void of, of life. And so why would we want to create chaos and stress in our lives when we're bored? because we're traumatized and we don't even know it yet. So um, that's why he felt the depression. He knew something was wrong. He knew that he needed to get the help and the support that was important for him to live, but yet he never really understood it. He couldn't relate to it. He says, I attended programs here in prison to try and improve my outlook and change my thoughts. While I was home, I attended NAAA, Gamblers Anonymous, and various self-help programs in a halfway house. However, upon release, I went right back to my addictions. I know my self-esteem is very low. I don't believe in myself and what I can accomplish. Sometimes when I'm working on a task, I am focused to do the best I can, but I consistently second-guess myself and give up. And I want to be secure without the drugs and alcohol. I've never been prescribed any medication. I love to golf and landscape, but sometimes these passions prevent me from surrounding myself with a strong support group. I know my family would be a, co a constant 
positive support as they have been so many times. Yeah, he knows the way. He knows the way, definitely. And uh, not believing in himself was the very reason why at this point, two years into my recovery, I knew the way before then. I fell off in 2011 and I was so unsure of all the knowledge that I had, all the education, all the good jobs, all the traveling, all the investments in what I had put forth in my life. One day took all that confidence away. It literally did. And so I get it. I understand what he means when he says that, you know, he, he had tried so much and his esteem was very low. He didn't believe in himself and what he could accomplish. Um, I know my family would be a constant positive support as they have been so many times. I attended halfway houses. These were reintegrated in society, into society through programs, employment, and eventually was referred to treatment centers. I was just beginning to attend treatment centers and family counseling with my father before this arrest happened. I believe that if I can find ways to deal with my mental deficiencies and stay close to my family on a constant basis, I can succeed. I need your help diagnosing my mental makeup, my struggles, my depression, and my self-esteem. Thank you very much for your willingness to help me. I truly look forward to meeting with you and continuing to work with you into the future. I know if I get the right help, I can be a positive, healthy, productive person. I look forward to that day to come. Sincerely, David. So let's open our hearts to David. And I would like to hear how you would respond to him. A person who has a loving family, which most addicts do because they try to fit in to all this greatness that's surrounding them. And when they feel that they don't have what it takes, they try to make a life happen for themselves and they really don't know what they're doing. So I went to meet his parents and, you know, I have the receipts here where I map quested going to Buffalo, New York on October the 7th, 2013. I booked that travel flight. And I got on the road and I went to go to see David's family. After I did a brief intervention and review of what his life is like, and I saw his room and I saw how well the parents lived and how beautiful everything was, how they accommodated me with um, travel expenses and different things like that. The coaching program, they put themselves into the coaching program. And that was very phenomenal for me because it built my self-worth. You know, it made me figure I can do one or two things. I can manipulate and play these people for their money to get a paycheck, or I can relinquish myself from guilt and work on my healing and my recovery and do the best that I can for the price that they were paying. And they would do anything that they could in order to take care of their son. And I was very appreciative to all that was going on there with them. So November 24th, I come home, I meditate, you know, um, after meeting with the family. And I was wondering if I would take this case. And what happened through meditation this is what came about. And this is why I say I reflected myself talking to me. So I was truly David um, in, this, in this scenario, although I was helping David and his family. So I said, dear David, greetings to you. Hope all is well. I missed meeting you on yesterday because he was supposed to come to visit. But I guess he wasn't able to get out of the halfway house. However, as things change, positions also change. I'm still here 
I just didn't want to overwhelm you with more news over what you had already found out. So he had found out some things um, he was unsure about. I told him time will allow the situation to sink in and give you options that will hopefully make you feel better in your position and your positive endeavors after being released. Keep reviewing options. I still await your response to the letter as I believe you may have been holding them for our conversation that I was not in attendance. I take it that you have come to terms with the result you now face. There are times when we are in the belly of the beast we cannot let go until it lets go of us. This is the power test. And this is where I incorporate Robert Sylvester Kelly. Seeing if you have what it takes to energize your life when you have to pursue it with only your decisions. You know, this decision right now with Robert Sylvester Kelly is so profound because he has to make a life changing decision. You know, does he continue to say that he is not guilty and move forward that way? That's a very big decision that he has to sit on and make a decision on. But back to David, life makes us see all that we did wrong when we were ready to review the personal show the show that we create for our own selves, our backdrop story. Only you are aware of the hidden things that others begin to know about you as they grow to know you. There are two ways that I would like you to look at this situation. Number one, if you truly have a problem with mental programming, mind choices that prevents you from making positive or right decisions, that can be worked on. It may take some time, but it's workable. Number two, if you had bowed out to the fact that you are a loser in life and that you are true a true product of defeat, now that option is all, almost basically impossible to work with. I will tell you, however, right now, we need not meet if you are a person who believes in option two. Everything comes from within you. No program, no medication, no outside situation will balance anything. It starts with you first. Then the manifestations of other things will keep things in check. Hopefully this letter finds you with nothing to complain about. If not, I hope the energy from this letter will be a soothing comfort your way. Until we meet again, Hotep. Hotep is a a greeting, an Egyptian greeting and, and conclusion of, you know, a positive attribute, a universal positive attribute. And so with Robert Sylvester Kelly, we're going to go back to him. The reason why I feel so connected was because if you think of the partying and you think of the the um, trapped in the mental mindset. You are going to definitely see alcohol, drugs, fast life, the Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, concept that's in the Bible, the biblical premise. And, and so all of that is going to come to the forefront for you to show you, to show us. It showed me in my own recovery that, you know, yeah, you can look good as good as you want to look. You can smell as fine as you want to smell. You can drive the fanciest vehicle. You can have the greatest education. You can have the biggest bank account a, a single person can have and floss and, 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 and fleek with the ego and flow with the, you know, uh, um, the best of them. Because what's happening is you are maneuvering your life through the concept of social engagement. And in those social engaging times, you have individuals who are watching you that you don't even see, that have jealousy, envy, hate, and all of that chaos surrounding them towards you. And then we wonder, why did this happen? 
to me. I was so on the game. You know, addiction is supposed to happen to people with no money, who lacks, you know, the ability to even do anything, who with no education. You know, this is what we're taught. But that's not true because when you go into the rooms of recovery, addiction is knowing that, number one, you are hopeless. You are helpless at a point in time. Now, one thing I feel about the 12 steps of recovery is they needed to be upgraded. And so in my master's level, I upgraded my alternative recovery solutions. And I said, okay, I'm only hopeless for a certain amount of time. Because again, when you feel hopeless, you have no hope. So that option number two, if we bow out to the fact that we are a loser in life and that there is, that we are a true product of defeat, that makes it impossible to work with going further. And I believe that that's where the um, Alcoholics Anonymous go a little bit too far because to keep someone in that position will cause them to feel worthless. No, you want to empower. You want to self in, 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 con you want to self connect so that you can grow out of this. Someone asked a question about Robert Sylvester Kelly. Do we think that he has the mental capabilities of go, going through another trial and being found guilty? If he knows he hasn't done anything, absolutely. He has the ability to stand strong no matter if 50 people come up against him. Mm -hmm. He has the power to do this. So I really wanted to share that with someone who may know someone who may need this information because I feel that Robert Sylvester Kelly and the R. Kelly Appeal TV channel is continually helping me heal as I grow as a human being in this world. His, his story is empowering me to stay in recovery. It is bringing me near people to preach the, the um, prophecy to. And I'm not talking about the prophecy of, you know, hell, fire, and damnation. Absolutely not. I'm talking to learn self, grow within self, do more for self, to have a connection with self so you can do more, be more, have more, own more, you know, um, create more, create, create, create. And that is the empowerment that I choose to make for my creative content on our Kelly Appeal TV. To me, if I reach those who are the most valued in the world, and that is the individual who needs to t change the addictive mindset into something of a recovery-based perspective and not just the facts of the case. See, this is the backstory, the original backstory to who created the R. Kelly Appeal TV and how the R. Kelly Appeal TV channel become so passionate to where people are interested in what I'm saying. And it makes logical sense with the way that I create on this channel. And as a business developer, one thing I like to do is help empower people to know that they have their greatness sitting right on their throne. They're sitting on it. And I'm not talking about in a sexual manner. I'm not talking about sex. I'm talking about you're sitting on the power that your mind can produce for your physical body to go out and create. And I sit back and I look at, you know, I'm a, a, a landlord. And so I have a, a lot of people who have applied for renters moratorium and, you know, during the pandemic and their rent was free. And I was sitting back wondering why. Are they putting money into a free system, giving away, you know, um, checks that people can use for, you know, whatever they want to use for when they could put it into an employment opportunity 
a, a opportunity to apply for, which we did have the opportunity to also apply for uh, business development and, you know, money to start your own business. And then those people didn't really have businesses and they were just playing with the money. And now they have that credit. Now they have, you know, issues, civil lawsuits going on. And I mean, it's just so much happening. So much is happening in the concept of free things. But if we learn to continue to stay in the habit of work ethic, something that they've taken away from us by dumbing us down and making us feel as though, oh, free is the best way. I can get this unemployment. I ain't even got to work. Now, all of a sudden, the moratorium is over and people are expecting me to, you know, uh, bend the rules to, you know, give them a few more, more weeks to get this together and that together. But bills are due as a landlord. Bills are due. So at that point, where do we hold people accountable? And, you know, how far do we go to say that you are responsible for the way you chose to do what you do? Why weren't you saving? Why weren't you investing? Why weren't you working? Because I worked through the entire pandemic because that's what I need to do in order to feel as though I'm working on my recovery. We have to get up and get moving and get active and get creative so that we can create something for the world and for ourselves. And, you know, I, I really and truly feel for the R. Kelly um, case. I feel for the Chicago trial. I feel for the individuals who have to, you know, face the music to what these women have done. And I also saw something about, you know, um, the young lady, um, Joanne Kelly um, Jr., you know, because I know she was named after her mother or her grandmother, Joanne Kelly, grandmother. But Joanne Kelly Jr. Uh, literally needs money to go to college. I've seen a, a, a headline about that. Yes, her mother is worth X amount of dollars. But is that money in investments? Is that money in other people's pockets that she has to pay back for being who she was and how she showed and proved herself during the whole docuseries perspective? Because that's when I heard of her. I didn't hear of an Andrea Kelly before that time. So again, you know, all this stuff is very pertinent. It's very positive. It's very you know, productive when you look at life from a healing perspective, a recovery-based perspective. But when you're in your addiction and trust and believe, when you have to lie and manipulate and bamboozle and treat people, um, give them what they want to hear, you're actively in addiction. I don't care if you don't touch a drug or not. If you're just fueled off of stress and anxiety and trauma, and chaos, that is addiction. It's emotional addiction. And that's where we need to learn as a community how to build from that, to heal from that. And that's what R. Kelly is gonna to have to do. So I know that when I was incarcerated, I started a, a, um, a lifers business course where, you know, Ashland University came into the correctional institution and they started to help the lifers get a business associate's degree and i was the first one i was so happy that the warden allowed this i was the first um i was the first um tutor class to help them get through it and to get through it is not about the educational part about about it it wasn't the educational piece it was the motivational piece that came with, you may get exonerated tomorrow. You never know. So you better have something to fall back on because in your life, you are not going to be able to go out and get a regular job. You're going to have to create one for yourself. And that's what I saw in the industry of healing and recovery. 
It was 100% accountability. No more dependent on the government because the government is not going to help you in that manner. Many of doors are going to be shut for those who have found themselves incarcerated. That's why as a landlord, I don't do background checks as much as I would if I was in a location where, you know, it was mandatory. It was a governmental program. No, I do this because you will show me who you are eventually. And then from there, I will deal with what we have to deal with. But to give, you know, opportunity to veterans who have been, you know, serving our country and and doing all that they could do to help and support us in this system that is so corrupt, take people's lives in many different forms, you know, tell us how to behave, tell us how to live, tell us what to buy, tell us what to eat, tell us, you know, what we can do with our bodies. Amazing. Amazing. So that's what I want to talk about. So next time we meet in the backstory of the R. Kelly Appeal TV, this is not about the appeal, but it is on the appeal channel. It is on the We Can Fly in July series because that's what we're doing. We are hitting our highs and lows and our pinnacles and our successes as we watch the R. Kelly appeal challenge itself through motions, through, you know, um, what, you know, people are saying, even all the way down to Steven Greenberg coming back, you know, as another energy source that did R. Kelly wrong at another point in time in the past. You know, do we, do we worry about that? Do we pay any attention to that? You have people who are, who were there during the time and now all of a sudden Steven Greenberg is back. And that is something that should we even feel some, some way about, you know, should we feel some way about this? Because there was a lot that went undiagnosed and and uncharged on his behalf as well because certain things that attorney Bonjean has done in the limited amount of time that she's been in existence with the Robert Sylvester Kelly case from the federal trial things that happened before that was just criminally criminal justice inhumane took place under the the nurturance and guidance and and loyalty of someone who was not loyal someone who was not loyal and when the money left the the you know membership things started happening and R Kelly is not crazy see R Kelly knew what was going on you know um he feels, he knows, he's alive, he's human, and he understands what is taking place in his own case. Because I know I did. Even um, being laced and having a mental breakdown to the point where I did not know my name for 41 days sitting in a county jail cell. Well, maybe not 41 days, but a few of those days not being able to even comprehend of where if I were in, if I was in an insane asylum or if I was incarcerated in a jail or did I really hurt someone to the point of, you know, the death penalty, the fight, what happened, you know? I mean, the way that the documentation looks on paper is horrific. But according to some who saw what took place some people said that it was nothing more than a a playground elementary school fight but when you have your whole life ahead of you when you're trying to start a business that helps small businesses get up and running of course you're going to have those people who say no i'd rather you be an employee and file a w-9 or W, I'd rather you file a W-2 than a W-9. I'd rather you file, you know, um, under the auspice of this organization or that company than to have your own. 
Because then when you have your own, you can make as much money as you like. It's all in how you put your creative content together. So I want to, to, to let you know that the power is within you. The power is within you, beloved. The one that's listening to this right now. You own the rights to your world. And as you get up every day and create and wonder how people do this or how people do that and you get inquisitive, that means you're ready to step out and expand the horizon of the success that comes with who you are. But then you have a system that has a glass ceiling that that puts us down before we even hit the glass ceiling. Some of us got to hit the glass ceiling. And when we hit the glass ceiling and we go beyond and above what we are supposed to do because of, of the idea of passion, that's when the glass ceiling breaks and we get all cut up. You know, some of us, you know, feel like, oh my God, it's the end of the world. But then some of us feel like, okay, let me brush some of this debris off of me. I understand. I got a few bruises. I got a few things going on. You know what I'm saying? Um, but I can still maintain. I can still keep moving. So that glass ceiling did nothing but expand the horizons that grew and forced us to come out of our comfort zone. And when and then when we do that, we realize that there is no real uh, uh, existence of someone controlling something. No, we were the controllers ourselves. That's why when I go back into the storyline or the backstory to this letter right here, that letter was not to David. That letter was to me to empower me to keep going from where I remembered myself starting. 2011, you figure, 2013, Two years, if that, still fresh in recovery. But I'm learning more. I'm realizing through stories of other people who just couldn't get it right. Even this man. In and out, in and out, in and out. Okay? That's not what I'm going to do. If I'm going to be in and out, it's on a whole case like R. Kelly. It's a one-time thing. So he's been in and out and in and out. And he has a big story of his life. If you go and look at the docket and you print a co copies from everything from 2008 till now, it is the same exact case. They may have different numbers. It may have a little bit of, of addendum to it, a, an addition or an attachment or something else. It may even have a different uh, uh, um, uh, number, a state number to a federal number. But it's still the same situation. And that's exactly what my case is. The same situation. Going through court at one point, 2011, serving 41 days coming home. Bond and continuances, five years. Sentencing um, on the sixth year. Serving three years. And then... Um, in the same case, you have the timeline of probation and parole, five years, but got out early on both of those. So the thing I'm saying is that you never know how long the situation is. And it looks like, oh, he's always in trouble. She's always in trouble. It's not that. It's the fact that we have been pushed through this system and sent here, sent there, told to go get counseling, even motions. Motions show movement. That's why it's called motion. It shows legal movement in what is happening in the case. And each time a movement happens, that's when we can truly say that, um, how can I put it? How can I put that? We can truly say that we are still dealing with the same concept, the same scenario of the same situation, but it looks like we've been incarcerated for X amount of years. If you look at me, 
you will look at my case as as entrance into the slave ship march 23rd 2011 you don't see a bond you don't see me coming out you don't see a bond you don't see i mean you do see it but most people aren't paying attention to that they're looking at the entrance date and the exit date so if the entrance date was 2011 and i was off of parole and um probation in 2020 i know 2000 and yeah 20 because i was supposed to be on for five years so i got out in 18 19 20 21 22 23 i was supposed to be off of probation without you know if i was to have served everything 23 so from 2011 to 2023 that was the entrance and exit in and off the slave ship but that's better than 34 years at eight years per felonious assault count four times eight is 32 all day so my point is to get deep into who the backstory is of R. Kelly is I know this system. I know how I was treated. I know how I was, you know, and I truly can say that a lot of people feel that I was railroaded um, based on how everything went down. I mean, you know, what would you say? I don't know. I don't know, but I know within my heart, I'm just grateful to be free, to be home and come back to the house in which I lived for 30 uh, for 24 years, 25 years, and only to be having it given to me, gifted to me, because I knew that I was on the right track and I knew that I was trying to do the right thing. But the test, the demonic test, the test of, you know, insure, unsurety, the test of low self-esteem, the test of, you know, let me try this and see if this can bring her down that test, that ultimate test, I failed it. But in failing it, I built myself again. And this is where Robert Sylvester Kelly and I come to connection because it's about the building. It's about the growing from what we know and moving forward and leaving all that past behind. So the old me, which was incarcerated, is now the new me, wisdom, wisdom is the name and it stays there it is forever there because without wisdom i would never know how to collab collaborate and cooperate the next greatest thing in my life and i tell you what it's been a journey it's been hellified i lost family members while i was incarcerated my uncle i lost him um when i come home i lose my son never being able to say goodbye to him. But see, all that was a part of the miseducation of the mentality of addiction because that was supposed to be there to show me, are you in recovery or are you in addiction? Are you going to go back? Because you say you have to be strong in recovery. So you have to say, like my grandmother always told me, let the dead bury the dead. And I never understood what that meant until I had to face it. Because if I'm living in this world and the deceased have moved on, if I'm staying here as the walking dead, I might as well be just as deceased. But if I am here, I am to live. I am to empower myself. I am to motivate myself. Most people didn't understand how I handle my son's murder. But what they do now get is that everyone has a point where they have to let things go. It is not up to me. I only bring this child in, or these children into the world. But the most high within them creates the, the umbilical cord cut. And at that point, growth has to happen from them and they have to make the initial assessment of how they're going to live their lives. And when you know better, you do better. And when you are taught better, there are no excuses. There are no guilts that parents should hold because of the fact that this happened or that happened. No, hold no guilt, 
hold no remorse. Do what you need to do today so that you will have a guilt-free conscience when things fall apart. So with that, I thank you for being here and, and experiencing the backstory to the R. Kelly Appeal TV channel. And um, please feel free, you know, if you need to inbox me um, on a personal level to talk about some of the things in which we spoke about. I do have life coaching consultation services that are very, very, you know, um, inexpensive. I do meet and greets. I come out. We can chill and, you know, in your community. And you can show me things that you've experienced and talk to me about how to publish and, and, and connect to start to begin to write your life story. I can help you do that. Um, and if it is personal and private, please email me at scales to success LLC at gmail.com. And that is in the about section and some other information of how to contact me. So I thank you. Please let's say a prayer for Mr. Robert Sylvester Kelly and his situation um, coming up August the 15th, um, his pre-trial. And, you know, I, I, I just, I, I just pray that everything goes in his favor, you know, um, and I'm not going to give up on him. I'm going to constantly connect life to, you know, the R. Kelly case because R. Kelly was tr is truly a genius and we need more geniuses, you know, to come forth to the forefront and not be afraid and speak their truth and learn how to empower others. So next time we do the um, backstory to the R. Kelly Appeal TV channel, we're going to talk about cognitive behavior, you know, how I was able to take that addictive personality and, and turn it into something healing, um, take that time of incarceration to heal myself and help people in the process of healing. Yeah. I had to cuss some people out and I had to, you know, stand my ground because I'm gonna stand my ground no matter where I am. You know what I'm saying? So yes, I have to stand my ground and I have to learn how to deal with bullies on a bully level and and do it with respect to where I'm not going to the hole because I couldn't handle you because you don't care whether you, you know, because you're here for life. You know, these are things that R. Kelly is dealing with in there. He's dealing with, you know, what choices do he fight because if he files for a judicial, you better not have no issues coming out of there. That dude that attacked him, that right there could mess up a judicial easily if they were going to give him, you know, good time credit. But then they go deeper in and they find out what truly happened. And then from there, they take it and they say, okay, well, we're going to remove this. There was a situation I'll share in another time that almost lost me my early release, but I still got it. You know what I'm saying? So, so yeah, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. And this is thing, we're more than a conqueror. You know what I mean? This is why I think Kirk Franklin is in the whole concept and scheme of talking about R. Kelly. Because remember that song, Stump. All my people, Stump. You know what I'm saying? You know, so... Let's hold that and empower each other. Thank you for liking, commenting, sharing, and subscribing to this podcast. We appreciate every view. We appreciate every comment. And we love you. And as always, keep it 100. No matter what, keep it 100. And we'll see you next time.